Um, warm welcome to the session this afternoon. Um, just to start by introducing myself. So I am Pete Lee. I'm the Quality and Continuous Improvement Director at Victrex. Uh, and on behalf of Victrex, I'd just like to thank the organisers of the Innovation Festival for giving us the chance to be a part of the event this month. I know I've uh, enjoyed all of the sessions that I've joined over the last couple of weeks, so hopefully we can give something back over the next 45 minutes or so. Um, so today's session, today's session is going to be all about um, the innovation that's taking place in Lancashire, which is helping the world's you know, largest automotive and aerospace manufacturers to deliver on the commitments to really improve transportation around the world in terms of its cleanliness, sustainability, um, clean technologies and so forth. And, and in particular, we'll intend to have some discussion around um, what are some of the barriers to adoption in, in those markets as well. So you know, it's all very well having good innovation, but unless you can get it adopted in the marketplace, you don't. The world doesn't gain the benefits of that, and you don't gain the benefits of the job creation and, and so, so forth. So before we start, let me introduce the panel. Um, with me today, I'm pleased to have James Myers. He's head of technology for aerospace at Victrex. Um, has many years' experience with polymer composite materials, and previously worked at Zojac Aerospace and together with Green Tweed in the past. Um, also That's joined amazing. by James. Hi, James. So we're joined by James Bonnet. James Bonnet is our Victrex e-mobility programme leader. So James develops uh, strategies for development of innovation in e-mobility and their implementation and has led a number of projects around electric powertrains and use of our materials in there. Uh, we also have David Simpkin joining us, even though it says Pete Lee on his window. <laughs> so Dave, is, uh, Dave joins us from the Warwick Manufacturing Group, and he's going to really help us to bring a real customer perspective to, to the question of adoption and innovation of clean technology, having worked many years at Jaguar Land Rover. And uh, I'm also pleased to welcome Professor Harry Hoster from Lancaster University. So he's the Professor of Physical Chemistry and Director of Energy. And his research is focused on clean energy, sustainability, and in particular, energy storage and clean transport. So as a, a start point, I shall um, share my screen and start by just giving a very short introduction to, um, to Victrex. So hopefully everyone can see my screen there now. So, so Victrex is a FTSE 250 company and we are headquartered here in Lancashire. Um, the majority of our manufacturing takes place here in Lancashire, as does the majority of our R&D and innovation. Um, however, about 98% of our sales are overseas. Uh, so we're actually a, a local Lancashire company on the banks of the River Wire that uh, invest in manufacturing innovation here, yet everything we sell is sold overseas in the Americas, Europe or, or Asia. Um, our business is based on a very high performing polymer called Peak. Um, so Peak has a very specific set of properties that allows it to solve problems that a lot of other materials don't. Uh, often it's a high performing polymer, so often it's competing with metals in various applications. Um, we're not a commodity manufacturing company, one thing I should just point out. Um, Peak isn't a cheap material, so what that means is our customers only use our products if it really solves a problem for them. And as a result, most of the markets we operate are in are highly regulated or high risk ap applications. And, I'll just give you a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a feel for um, some of the applications where you might find Victrex materials. So in your car, most of your cars will have some Victrex peak in it already. Um, so when you put your foot on the brake pedal to stop, uh, there's Victrex peak in your ABS braking system, one of the one of the things that helps your car to stop safely. Uh, if you take the Boeing Dreamliner aircraft, that contains over a ton of peak manufactured here in Victrex on every Dreamliner aircraft. Uh, we think there's about 13 million people walking around the world with um, Lancashire Peak, you know, inside their body, implanted in their body, and about 70% of spine fusion surgery around the world implants Victrex Peak into, uh, into somebody's spine to improve their, their quality of life. Oil and gas pipelines are now starting, starting to make the transition to peak composites from, from metals. And, uh, and the reason why your music sounds good on a lot of your electronics devices is actually peak film in the speakers of your, of your electronic devices as well. So we operate in a number of uh, different key markets and two of them we're going to talk about today, automotive and aerospace, uh, are two of the key ones there for us. And the other thing I just take away from that is really the, the future success or otherwise of our business is completely dependent on knowing our customers really well, understanding their markets and innovation, innovating to solve their problems and then getting those innovations adopted. 
So if I just, uh, um, just talk a little bit about sustainability, so uh, which I find is many of our um, products, innovations and markets actually relate directly to sustainability. Um, a lot of our products are, are being adopted by the large aircraft manufacturer to lightweight aircraft um, to help the transition from petrol and diesel automation through to cleaner electronic um, electric automation um, transportation um, trauma plates knees medical devices to help improve the quality of, of people's lives um, but if you look at within ourselves um, we have quite strong 2023 sustainability targets that we publish to the city um, and a lot of our improvement work in the company is focused around these and we put them into three kind of categories so one's sustainable solutions which is what we're talking about today which is you know how do our products and innovations help the world to be more sustainable there's resource efficiency where we look at our own operations and how do we make our own operations more sustainable uh, lower carbon footprint uh, and such like and then the third one is social responsibility um, you're taking I guess our position in the local community very seriously um, really expanding what we can do with local schools with STEM uh, involvement in festivals uh, such as this one but I think uh, that, that's probably enough about Victrex you're probably more keen to hear about the innovation that's uh, that's been going on so uh, but with this I'll hand over to James Myers to talk about uh, some of the innovations in in aerospace okay I just Thanks, hand over uh, stop sharing yep Okay, um, hopefully you can all see that. Well, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Pete said, my name is James Myers. I'm the uh, Head of Technology for Aerospace at uh, Victrex. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we're doing in the current aerospace sector and obviously in light of the current climate and the post-pandemic new world as it is. Um, in terms of more traditional activity within the aero sector, um, in the bottom left, you see a lot of our activity around uh, what we call system attachments, which is um, fitting the fixtures on the typically on the interiors of aircraft. A lot of our peak materials find their way into there. Um, more widely, we also turn those materials into films for what we call thermal acoustic blankets. So basically the sheeting that goes between the inside um, uh, cabin and the outer fuselage just to keep the noise and temperature under control. Um, but what I'm going to talk a little bit more about this afternoon is more around our structural components um, activity, particularly with respect to air composite solutions. Um, particularly our Victrex A250 unidirectional tape. So this is um, part of the same family of polymers as uh, Pete mentioned, the, the PAEKs, um, but it's actually a low melt variant of that. Um, and obviously with the uh, interest of being low melts, there's a number of benefits that can be uh, obtained in the likes of uh, reduced energy consumption by low, low processing temperatures and so on. Um, and we are actually finding a lot of poten potential and um, notable interest in terms of exploiting that in, um, as I said to, uh, as I referred to, should I say, um, kind of new aerospace markets. Um, particularly within the likes of personal air transport or um, EV toll or electronic vertical takeoff and landing vehicles. Um, fundamentally, air taxis to you and me, really. Um, so not only do we see the benefits um, highlighted on the left in terms of um, improved weight um, to, to uh, uh, weight performance, which is obviously very, very critical in this, um, these touch applications, um, but also uh, much higher manufacturing rates as well. Um, so what we refer to there is six and a half times faster tape placement speed, and I'll, I'll explain that a little more detail in the uh, um, coming days, uh, sorry, coming, coming minutes. Um, but fundamentally, the ability to shorten those life cycle, uh, part, cy part cycle times um, via automated methods is, is part of where these, these innovations are actually really um, standing chance to gain a lot of ground in this, particularly in this sector. Um, as you can see, the, the, the uh, representative aircraft on the screen, whilst it is intended to fly, it is actually much more akin to the kind of the air, air, sorry, automotive model of manufacture and deployment. So there's going to be a lot more uh, requirement in terms of high volume manufacture there. So just to cover a little bit um, about some of the material and process aspects that allowing us to realize those kinds of rates with these materials, um, I'll touch a little bit on um, a method called automated tape placements. Um, as the, as the name suggests, it is exactly that. So fundamentally a, a robotic arm that uh, deposits these uh, tape materials into a shaped tool. Um, and as you can see from some of the stats on, stats on screen, there's some pretty significant savings and improvements potential from the combination of that technology and these materials here. 
So whether that be um, cost savings based on that um, uh, representative example there, which is actually based on a door component um, of, of uh, three and a half million dollars plus a year, um, up to or alternatively the faster manufacturing methods um, of up to 20 meters per minute deposition rates. Um, and there's always going to be a balance in terms of performance, deposition rates, application, and so on. So that's a candidate example based on this specific um, requirement. But just to kind of frame the context, that is very, very comparable to the incumbent materials that we'd see with um, thermoset based um, uh, composite materials, which are a lot more um, uh, pre prevalent in the aerospace sector at this point. So the benefits of thermoplastics in particular are around not only the, the, um, the, the deposition rates and, and the, the ability to make um, high rate manufacture components viable with this, um, but also they are fundamentally re uh, recyclable as well. Um, the the, the um, life cycle of, of that recycling is still to be to be fully exploited in all fairness, um, but there's a huge amount of activity going on both within core aero sectors, but also supporting activities as well uh, within some of the uh, uh, supporting tier uh, manufacturers and suppliers um, within the uh, uh, composites field. So, um, but also again, just to highlight the uh, the comparable with the various uh, methods of, uh, of manufacture as well. So you would have seen on the previous screen that based on a what we would call a high deposition rate, you could get a, a an acceptable performance. We can actually get incredibly good performance by this in situ method um, with what we would say zero percent porosity, um, still some comparable energy savings as well. Um, but again, it's all about balancing the requirements of the um, of the uh, application with the uh, requirements of the end product as well. Um, so on, on that note, I'll hand over to James, who will go into a little bit about uh, the automotive side of things. So, OK, James, all yours. OK, thank you. So hopefully the screen's just flipped across and you can now see automotive innovation. Um, mm -hmm. So what I'm going to talk about is, uh, just for five minutes, how does Victrex Peak help contribute uh, to our customers reducing vehicle emissions? So within our uh, automotive business unit, there's four main areas uh, where we have peak polymer applications that support um, our customers delivering sustainability and, and, and vehicle emission reduction. And those four different areas are around, uh, the first is engine gears. Uh, so that, uh, as, it, as it says in the, in the phrase, it's, it's a polymer uh, molded into a gear shape that sits as, as part of an engine gear system. Uh, the second area is transmission applications. So these are quite small parts. Uh, they usually have a tribological or a wear function and they're, they're molded uh, around um, for specific examples of thrust washers, seal rings uh, or bearing cages. Uh, and the third uh, major area is one that our speaker Peter already mentioned about. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very tiny uh, tappets and poppets that sit within uh, ABS systems. So advanced uh, braking systems basically. And then the final area I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on is, is, is my area of speciality, if we like, and that's um, electrical insulation components. So that can be a range, it can take a range of different product forms, um, but usually the material is in an electric machine, like a traction drive, uh, that, and it provides an isolation function uh, for, that, for that drive motor. So let's have a quick look at some of the benefits that we can get from using peak gears. Uh, on the screen now, you can see um, a nice close-up of an injection molded uh, gear, and that's that's what Peak looks like up close. It's over molded onto um, a metal insert, which then sits on the uh, sits on a, a rotating cylinder. And this is part of a uh, mass balance system, which is used in um, uh, by ICE engines, uh, combustion engines, sorry, uh, for what it does is it balances out the different forces. There's, there's a range of different rotational uh, and, and um, longitudinal forces that act on that motor, and it makes sure that it does not start to resonate and cause damaging uh, vibration that might damage the system. So you can see on the, on the left, um, basically the, the, the main primary benefits are around um, delivering what's called NVH uh, improvement. So NVH stands for noise, vibration, and harshness. 
Uh, so actually, in a certain instance with one of our customers, we found that this system, that they could basically half the noise uh, and vibration harshness, harshness coming out of that system by using polymer gear technology. Uh, also, it helps to reduce the weight, which can reduce the energy uh, and the moment of inertia in these systems. And uh, where possible, we always like to highlight for our customers if there's a, a cost potential saving. So you can see uh, just on the, on the graph on the bottom left here, this, this is how the uh, cost performance looks when we compare to some other types of systems that might be designed with metal gears, for example, in this type of mass balance system. So next slide is a, is a nice summary slide there. Um, enjoy the silence and get rid of gear wine. So that's a, a nice sort of marketing slide there as we've got, we've got whilst we've done all the technical work and quantified the value uh, of our innovation uh, in the background, always nice to have a good marketing slide to help communicate that message in just one, uh, in one image. So the other area that I wanted to talk to you today about is looking at how Victrex Peak is used in electric motors or traction drives. Uh, and in this specific instance, we're going to have a quick look at um, peak as use uh, as it's used as a coating for a magnet wire or sometimes called a winding wire that's used in electric machines. So if I move on to my summary slide here, what what we're showing really is an image here uh, on the uh, on the left hand side, which is um, it's called a, a, a stator. And it's part, the key, one of the key parts of, the, of an, any electrical machine. So you can see all these uh, pins that are sticking out here. These are all uh, electrical wires, usually copper conductors that have been coated with peak. And that forms uh, the, the outer half of the uh, electric machine and the inner half is, is, the, is, the, is called the rotor. And that's the bit that rotates uh, because of the magnetic field that's, that's occurring uh, in, in this electric field. So um, the, the performance benefit here that we're talking about is, uh, is, is a 2% less energy consumed if we, uh, if we take a conventional designed electric stator and then we redesign the insulation system using a uh, high performance Victrex Peak, what we can basically do is improve the thermal efficiency of that system. And that means that there's less loss that occurs within that electric motor. So when we are using that electric motor, we can run it across um, uh, what's, what's, what's recognized as a, as a global um, uh, drivetrain um, uh, cycle that basically defines how every vehicle has to be measured. It's, it's in the same way for the, uh, for the CO2 emissions for combustion engine. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's a drive cycle requirement for electric powertrains as well. And if we run those two uh, scenarios of a conventional electric motor, next to a peak uh, peak magnet wire wound motor, we get an overall 2% reduction in the energy that that vehicle will use across that drive cycle. And what that means for our customers is, what they can actually do is they can deliver the same uh, range in their new electric vehicles at a reduced battery cost. And the reason that that, that number is so high is because um, it's, it's reasonably well known, but electric vehicles are massively affected by their battery range and their battery capacity that defines the cost of manufacture of that vehicle. So any small saving that can be done on energy there can help contribute to a lower cost vehicle and a lower cost battery. The other uh, potential attractive benefit is that if you use uh, our, our brand of Victrex XPI Peak uh, in your motor windings, you can, you can use the benefit in the other way. You can say, I will keep the same battery capacity and cost, but I'll choose to have my vehicle and market it that it can drive further. Uh, and this is a particularly advantageous benefit because a lot of customers, consumers like, like, uh, like people on the line, they, have, uh, they are concerned about what's called range anxiety, and it's a limiting factor that's, that's well, it's, it's holding back certain levels of adoption of electric vehicles um, in the market today. So I think I've come to the end of my uh, session, Pete, if you'd like to. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Thank you much, both of you. Um, so we're just going to a um, session of Q&A now. Um, maybe I'll just quick it off quickly, uh, James, while we've got your attention. Um, so you, you shared a few innovations there, um, but we talked at the beginning about how we then overcome the barriers to adoption so that 
those innovations actually get adopted in the marketplace and make a real difference. Uh, can you say a few words about well, you know, what does Victrix do in order to help drive the adoption of the innovations we've talked about today? Yeah, so um, as you said, it's, it's one thing having an innovation and an idea and, 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 and man, being able to manufacture that, but having uh, customers and end users adopt that is, a, um, <laughs> is another step in that process. Um, so at Victrex, there's a, there's a few things that we do um, to try and uh, promote adoption of new technology. And one of those is around de-risking adoption of new technologies. But one model that we like to use uh, internally is this model here that I'm showing, which, which, which is actually developed from some research that was done about 60 or 70 years ago on agricultural farming. But it, was, it became popularized uh, in the dot-com era when, uh, when everybody was developing new software and they were trying to promote adoption of new software because people adopt new technologies uh, in different ways, according to our you know, normal human behavior. You do get uh, a group that are a very small minority, the, the innovators who are usually technology enthusiasts and they wanna grab new things and play with them. And they don't mind that it's not a finished article or if it's expensive. Um, and then as, as we sort of move through this model here, you can see the different uh, types of characters and about how they adopt new technology. You, you do get, uh, a group of earlier adopters who might be still quite early on, even though the product's not fully finished uh, and, and might require some refinement, but you can see the vast majority of people, they sit, in fact, two thirds of people sit in this, in this central area where, where we call them the early majority or the late majority. These guys, they want everything crossed and all, sorry, they want all the T's crossed and all the I's dotted. The product has to be finished and it has to be competitively priced and it has to be available for people. So if we, uh, and then we get the last bunch, sorry, who are the laggards, they're more of the skeptics. And these are the people that, you know, they, they still don't own a television, for example. But, but what you can do is you, you can choose to try and work with different groups as you're uh, getting your technology adopted. And obviously for us, if we're delivering innovation, the most attractive group to work at uh, and, and work with are companies that are more um, technology enthusiasts or visionaries. And that's who we try and focus a lot of our work with and do the early, create our first sort of uh, reference in the market, Pete. So we're quite focused on that. And then the other thing that we do is we spend a lot of time and effort in thinking about the technical proof. You know, I, I showed some slides and James had some fantastic slides with, with numbers and quite powerful numbers on them about potential savings or potential benefits. So we, we work quite hard on demonstrating the credibility of those benefits and working a lot in research and development, certainly uh, on validating the technical proof. I don't know if anyone else has any other comments about um, how Victrex specifically or other companies work to uh, you know, to, to, to get adoption and reduce adoption barriers. Well, no, no, thank you, James. I was maybe going to turn at that point to David and ask David as um, David is someone who's worked for you know, a number of times at a, a major automotive OEM. Um, from, from the OEM's perspective, what are, what are some of the kind of things that make it more or less likely that an innovation will be adopted? Yeah, but it's one of the things, um, both, well, both James's, um, for the aerospace um, and for the automotive, both showed electrification and electrification is, is a sort of an advantage and a disadvantage for the automotive industry. Uh, clearly for those people who broke the mold like Tesla, they've got no background history. So they have no um, ax to grind in that sense. So they don't have big plants that are already making diesel engines or petrol engines. Um, for those companies that aren't that fortunate like the VWs of this world, the Jaguar Land Rovers of this world, um, you, you, your, uh, the money coming in is based on those innovators and early adopters. Um, so the electrification money coming in to the company isn't great. And they've got to support all these early majority, late majority people who have diesel engines and internal, internal combustion engines, petrol engines. So they've got money from one source, but they need to spend and innovate in a different area, which is electric machines. So um, one of the things we have to bear in mind for OEMs in particular, particularly true of big automotive companies in aerospace, is the amount of money they've already invested in making things like petrol engines and diesel engines. Um, there's a lot of money that goes into um, making plants. So there's a, there's a disincentive to change what you've got. Um, 
So for internal combustion engines, for instance, the, the one I always do is that um, almost everyone in the world now has a diesel engine liner which is diamond coated. Um, whereas Jaguar Lander has spent six million pounds doing a cast iron line. And once you've spent six million pounds on a production line, you damn sure as heck ain't going to change it to something that's different. So you've, you've got to, then that's, that's the downside about having a line where you're producing lots and lots of cars. The advantage of being where we are with electrification, particularly something like aerospace, is that you've got time and the opportunity to innovate. You're finding problems you didn't have before and you need to find ways of searching for those solutions. That's why things like you know the driving electric revolution that gov the government is putting money into trying to help UK industry innovate and support the supply chain. You know uh, companies like Vitrex. So you know in in my my role within Warwick University is you know we, we go find those companies and get them working together to try and create a, a better supply base. Um, but there's certainly lots of opportunities in electrification. Yeah, and I should have mentioned. Thanks for the reminder, David. That's part of the work that we showed around the electric motor uh, winding innovation, that was uh, that was funded through some government project money uh, that the Advanced Propulsion Centre provided and supported, connected basically Jaguar Land Rover and Victrex to be working together to do some of this validation. Yeah, and that's right, especially in the present environment. Um, oh, the, the government's making it easier for companies to get that cash. They're changing the funding so that the it's easier for companies to actually get a bigger, bigger pocket of money. So with a COVID, um, you know, we see lots of assistance to companies in um, our ways of furlough, but also the, they're assisting companies to be innovators and early adopters. Um, it's hard to do much innovation, perhaps in an automotive industry where it's fixed, but ele electric motors and electric uh, vehicles are, a, are an easy way in. And, and so, so maybe uh, link to that, David and James, we've had a, a question from Sarah Cassidy about how can Lancashire based SMEs engage with this knowledge that we're sharing today and get what they're doing. So um, are there any comments you want to make on that? Uh, sure, I could have a go at that first. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously there's, uh, there's a lot of the information around our most uh, in our innovations that are well progressed that we're proud of that we want to release publicly uh, that is available on the website uh, and I think also um, a, a, another way to um, to connect to that and and uh, would be to to leverage the um, the opportunities that David mentioned around not just regional growth funds perhaps which are specific to Lancashire but there's also a lot of uh, government, subsidies and encouragement there's, there's many projects being launched re regularly uh if you are operating in certain industries um that, that can help support uh advancements of new technology ideas yeah. and if i can just um add to that from a uh, an aerospace point of view as well um obviously within the northwest there's a huge uh, aerospace presence um both both by traditional aerospace but also uh, through emerging activities within the some of the new aerospace sectors as well so just really leveraging the, the that, that history and that heritage of how to make aerospace things is is something that certainly smes can tap into if they if you're that, that way inclined um if you're already serving the aerospace sector you've got the appropriate accreditations anyway you've already already um a lot of the way up that curve in a, in terms of being able to exploit that that um, that value in in these new sectors as well I mean, just kind of contextualize the overall um, potential market for ev cell in particular um we're looking at give or take about a 25 billion market um by the middle of the next uh, decade in unit sales alone, that's not including any of the infrastructure or associated um, technology that we really need to support it. That's just in actually physically things that will fly around in the air. So there's a, a, a nice piece of the pie potentially there for for people to get get uh, tapped into. Great, great. Yeah, I, I also think remember as, as an SME, always always look at the government sites. Uh, for instance, with the COVID uh, things at the moment, there was a, a call. I'm afraid it's finished now. If you're an SME, if you were looking to do this for things that you were going to do um, had COVID not happened, hence you could fund that. And there was a grant you could apply for to do that. So especially at the moment, if you're innovating, um, look at the government website, the grant website and see what pops up. They're putting a lot of things in place just at the moment 
to help companies innovate in uh, in a COVID world. So so always always look on their website. Great, thank you. Um, P Professor Hoster, maybe uh, I could ask you a little bit about, because we've talked a lot about um, individual travel and purpose travel. Um, I know you've been looking at the role of special purpose vehicles in driving, um, um, and even locally in terms of driving the use of some of the uh, move to electric. Um, what were some of the barriers you've found to adoption there and how do you think they could be overcome? Well, first, yeah, I would like to highlight that um, the uh, many inventions first uh, come to application in, in niche applications. So that is usually where you have the higher uh, margins and where, where you can find space to innovate. And so we look a lot into um, off-highway vehicles or uh, special purpose vehicles or materials handling which can often be the first ones to, uh, to be electrified without having too much uh, infrastructure issues because they are often, yeah, they have their shared yard with the company or whoever uh, hosts them. So, and I think at the same time, those um, most likely are also the kind of vehicles that uh, companies like Victrex made first um, a target, if I'm not wrong. Is that true? So things like refuse trucks or materials handling vehicles. Yeah. So, so sorry. Did you, we're we're not uh, we're, we're not manufacturing the uh, the vehicles. Usually, we're manufacturing uh, and supplying to a, a a what we'd call a tier. So, someone down that supply chain. But yeah, absolutely. They we we are finding um, opportunities for adoption. Actually, in not always in the normal vehicles that you and I would drive. Perhaps off highway ones like refuse ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, J James James Myers, um, you presented there um, on your slides about eVTOL and personal air taxis, and uh, I don't I don't personally see those flying around today. And so, what what what, what you know what, what um, do you think that presents a viable route for exploiting innovation either from Victrex or elsewhere in Lancashire, and why do you think that's the the case? Yeah, I mean, certainly. I mean, you have to be right, Pete. There's not one of uh, these things flying, quote unquote. Um, they are um, a number of them are going through kind of test flights in various parts of the world, um, uh, predominantly in the US and mainland Europe. But we do have presence in the UK with the likes of vertical aerospace as well, and even Rolls Royce um, power plant are getting involved in in the uh, support of that activity as well. In fact, there was something I think was on uh, the various uh, social media. Um, channels last week about a, a trial that they did at Cranfield University with their first um, run of, of a an EV toll based platform engine. Um, so there's, it's building momentum certainly, um, but you're right, we're not seeing that yet. Um, there are obviously a certain amount of hurdles that need to be addressed and, and jumped through in order to get those things flying. Um, as I said not just the fundamental kit themselves, but also the infrastructure to support it. Um, but one of the, the, the partners that we, we are working with a bit further field is actually um, aiming to have a working service in time for the 2024 Paris Olympics. So uh, anybody who's ever driven around Paris will think that'll be a godsend if it works. So uh, yeah, trying to avoid any of the, uh, the traffic jams will be a definite benefit. So that will be a real, real good showcase for that service to be, you know, be, be in the, um, in the uh, public eye in the not too distant future. And then obviously over the forthcoming um, decade, the expectation is that, um, again, uh, if, if this all pans out, it will, it will take off to that level that we talked about by the middle of the next decade. I think fundamentally we're still in a bit of a race to the start at the minute. There's a, a lot of activity going on around this. There's lots of different um, uh, uh, partnerships around the world, some large partnerships, some smaller partnerships, some new st um, uh, startups and so on, um, with a number of high profile um, people supporting the likes of Toyota, Hyundai, um, Porsche, even supporting some of these activities as secondary partners, the likes of Uber, Facebook, they've still got a, 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 a chip in the market as well. Um, but in terms of how we tap into this as well, um, as, as uh, we were talking about a little before, it's there's a lot of activity in terms of public sector funding going through by the likes of UKRI, Innovate UK, and the Faraday Challenge with, with batteries in mind in particular um, in the UK. So there's a, there's a lot of opportunity to really get, get into the mix um, with those if you've got something that you can actually um, uh, add, add to the party as it were. Thank you. Uh, uh, James Myers, while we just talk about aerospace, um, just listen to James 
on it talking about the cross the chasm model and how initially with an innovation you don't, you don't actually try and work with the company that's got the big market share you're working with the small innovators to prove it and de-risk it for those with the big market share mm-hmm. um, if you think about aerospace aerospace ultimately there's a quite a small number of large manufacturers of civil aircraft mm-hmm. um, how do you find that model plays in aerospace does it still apply the same or, or yeah, there's, different approach. yeah, there's still very much a chasm to cross. Um, traditional airspace is very, very, very definition to an extent, quite risk averse. Um, the, 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 the kind of the Boeing's and the Airbus of the world, they, they, they find developing a new, a new platform to be a, 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 a major innovation. Um, so, for example, the Boeing 787 was a, a step change compared to the previous material, uh, previous um, uh, aircraft, because it was significantly composites. But there was a huge amount of d- different innovations in there at the same time as well. Um, a lot more electric based uh, systems and so forth, for example. But that was a major step change. But if you look at it, it's not that much different to, to an, any other aircraft that's been flying for the previous 50 odd years, um, to, the, to the untrained eye anyway. Um, but uh, in, in terms of how we would um, uh, kind of develop those, those technology as well there's still a, a that chasm to be crossed they, they use a lot of TRL gradings for example in terms of how do you progress the technology how do you develop the maturity of that technology as well so in that kind of that TRL 3 to TRL 6 is often termed the chasm and that is from that kind of nice idea at a scientific level that's been proven to an extent to actually prove up the scalability and the the, the potential to commercialize the activity that, that there's still very much that that chasm to be crossed it's just uh, done typically in a different way, but obviously a longer period of time as well. I think something else that uh, Victrex and, and other companies that are that are trying to innovate and get innovations adopted, another area where you really have to work and plan is is around regulation mm-hmm. and around making sure that you are aware of the barriers to entry and that your products are you know accredited to certain industry standard regulations because without that often you get to a point where you you can't go beyond that with your uh, technology readiness level yeah yeah, yeah absolutely and and, and air, air in particular is is quite notorious for regulation and so forth and that can be sometimes seen as a bit of a barrier to adoption um which is why the certification bodies um like the, the faas and the arses uh, of, the, of the world uh, are actually really not fully certain about how to qualify these new EV type um, uh, uh, structures, for example. There's one school of thought that thinks actually it's much, much more like a helicopter, so do you, do you use that kind of certification route? But there's a lot of differentiation in there as well, with significantly more electrical systems in place, so it's actually still a bit of a, a certification challenge that needs to be understood. Because um, as um, um, some of our friends at uh, Boeing have said before, these things will carry a pulse. And so there's a, it's actually a, a, a bit of a challenge to get things flying when there's actually physical human beings on board, and, on board an aircraft. Yeah, I think speaking personally, I'm certainly glad about the level of regulation <laughs> if I ever, on well, the last time I stepped on the plane, I was. <laughs> I think in the UK and, and across the world, we're also facing a similar challenge in automotive when we think about the, the adoption or the beginning of adoption of autonomous vehicles that can actually drive, you know, without the driver. We, we do have these driver assisted systems which help us with safety now. But as we progress, you know, the end game in that, if we follow that through, is an autonomous vehicle. And, you know, how do governments regulate that when that technology is so, is, is so new um, and, and difficult to predict how, you know, uh, how it will pan out? Great. I think it's also interesting with, uh, with, with that sort of idea. Um, I know I couldn't transport a battery when I used to work with electric motorcycles. I couldn't transport a battery if I sent it in the post. I mean, big batteries now, big batteries. But I could fit it on the motorbike as a battery that drove me and do it. Because bat- uh, motorcycles, electric motorcycles are unregulated effectively because there aren't enough of them to make it worthwhile. So um, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. But, but certainly aerospace is, is a growing area. Uh, um, I was invited to a, a, an aerospace conference, would you believe? And, and my background is automotive and traction. And the reason being, they want to know how you manufacture in you know, thousands per year in volume. And that isn't what aerospace does in electrical machines. There are, there are aerospace already uses electrical machines in aeroplanes to do um, various actuation things. There are UK companies manufacturing that area now. 
Um, the idea now is that you move to traction. You actually, you know, you get it into the air with things. So we've seen the eVTOL stuff uh, that James, James M showed. Um, there's also, there was um, eFanX, which is, you know, a program for a, a little, uh, well, not that little actually, um, a small aircraft. And, and you know, you, you hear on the news, eFan X cancelled. Yes, it has been, as in the plane isn't going to happen because they're running out of funds for that. But the electrical machine and all the bits that make it happen, all the technology is still happening. They've just decided not to make the plane because the plane costs a lot of money and has to go through all these regulations. So they'll do all that. But still, in the end, you'll have um, innovation just waiting to happen when you know, the funding becomes available. Well, uh, thank, thank you very much, everyone, and um, thank you to everyone on, on the panel for all your help and support and, and input this afternoon. Um, it's certainly very clear to me that uh, this, this challenge isn't going away and will be continue to be a real you know, hotbed for innovation and, and, and real opportunity, I think, for, for everyone across the county to get involved in over the, over the coming years. Um, and I'll just uh, say thanks again to everyone in the audience as well for your, for your questions, and uh, I'll hand back to Dan to close out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a, a big thank you to all uh, uh, the panel for joining us uh, this afternoon and, uh, uh, and just some incredible uh, insight there into, uh, I'm sure for a lot of people, uh, some, some new uh, thoughts around exactly what's going on across the county and some, some fantastic work going on around sustainable transport. So appreciate all your time and thanks to the audience for joining in. There's um, obviously again tomorrow, we've got plenty more coming up. Uh, you can find out more if you visit the LancashireInnovationFestival.co.uk website to see exactly uh, exactly what's coming up. So thanks very much to everybody, and uh, we'll, we'll leave there. Thanks for thanks to you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Yeah. This October, you're invited to explore how you can harness innovation, consider new viewpoints and fresh ideas, and explore how learning, technology and innovation can come together. This brand new festival will champion some of Lancashire's latest innovations across 25 events, hosted by more than 50 speakers, including some of the county's innovation experts from higher education, health, clean technologies and many more. You can see the full schedule and register online for free at lancashireinnovationfestival.co.uk. So join us for a month of inspiration, collaboration and discovery around innovation. This October, you're invited to explore how you can harness innovation, consider new viewpoints and fresh ideas, and explore how learning, technology and innovation can come together. This brand new festival will champion some of Lancashire's latest innovations across 25 events, hosted by more than 50 speakers, including some of the county's innovation experts from higher education, health, clean technologies and many more. See the full schedule and register online for free at lancashireinnovationfestival.co.uk. So join us for a month of inspiration. Uh, hi, guys. I'm going to finish it there. Sorry, that this I'm having a bit of a trouble. I um, ah. oh, no, fine. I was having trouble getting somebody out of the session uh, on the attendees. Right. Uh, <laughs> Can't boot them out. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, yeah. They, they've, they've left now. And I was just a bit worried. I'm thinking, oh, gosh, someone, uh, I don't know, was a security issue, but it's great. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, are you guys, um, how did you find it? Uh, I, I thought the software worked quite quite well. I've never done a Zoom webinar that worked quite